235 hours of silence from the afternoon of April 22nd until this morning. With questions mounting about why he hadn't spoken, President Biden today finally went before the cameras to denounce the out-of-control protests on college campuses and anti-Semitism. It's basically a matter of fairness. It's a matter of what's right. There's the right to protest, but not the right to cause chaos. There should be no place on any campus, no place in America for anti-Semitism or threats of violence against Jewish students. So by now, you probably have your thoughts, your own thoughts on what's happening and maybe what should come next. Maybe you've even had a conversation that's gotten a bit uncomfortable. So too have Emmanuel Acho and Noah Tishby, the authors of the new book, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Jew. They join us here on the Hill in moments. Come on in, I'm Blake Berman. This is the Hill on News Nation. Here we are. Here we go. Hanging out with us today. Kelly Meyer, News Nation Washington correspondent. Hogan Gidley, of course, the former Trump White House deputy press secretary. Julia Manchester, national political reporter for The Hill. And Amisha Cross, former Obama campaign advisor and Democratic strategist. Hello to you all. Nice to have you all in. Hey. We'll get to uh, Emmanuel Acho and Noah Tishby in a moment. Excited to talk about them. They're, they're miking up, so we'll, we'll hear from them momentarily. But first, we heard today from President Biden about what's going on on these college campuses. He last spoke April 22nd for like 10 seconds. And there were lots of calls for him to get out before the cameras and say something, right? We had Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, on this show yesterday say, quote unquote, the silence is deafening. Um, So Amisha, why did President Biden wait so long? And did he hit the right tone today? He definitely hit the right tone. The president doesn't um, jump at the beck and call of the Speaker of the House. Um, I think that it's important to recognize that uh, we saw an amplification across campuses over the past few days. And I think that watching that was something that brought this to the attention of the president, but also something that made it more clear that something needed to be said, especially because the media narrative around these campus uprisings has been, quite frankly, unfortunate. We know that many of these students are organizing and they're demanding action and they want to see uh, a divestment when it comes to the sheer amount of funds that are being being funneled to Israel that is essentially being used to bomb and to um, create chaos and murder innocent civilians in Palestine or innocent Palestinians who have nowhere to go. I think that those students are speaking out in the same way that students spoke out against Vietnam, in the same way that students spoke out against the apartheid regime, in the same way that students have spoken out in decades past over and over again where they saw atrocities. What we have seen in some instances is a heightened level of violence. But again, those are very rare instances. And in those cases, we saw the authorities act and respond in the way that they should. The president came out and he reinforced the importance of First Amendment rights. He reinforced the importance of assembly. He reinforced also that students should feel safe on their campuses. Anti-Semitism should not happen. Racism should not happen. And that violence is intolerable. That is the right tone. It was, though, 235 hours of silence from the president of the United States, and I wonder why. Sure, well, it's political, of course. He's worried about Minnesota and he's worried about Michigan. And while Amisha's right, look, he may not be concerned about what the speaker has to say, I understand that. But what about the students? What about those who feel endangered? What about those who have witnessed not just the vandalism, but the violence that has occurred on these campuses? I mean, look, laws have been broken here. Forget for a minute about free speech and all these things that we hold so dear and we cherish and we would defend to the death. These people are violating the law. President Biden sort of alluded to that today, too. I understand he did. But the fact is, there are plenty of people in these campuses who are now pro-Hamas, pro-terrorist, anti-American chants that are going on repeatedly. I mean, these students are terrified. They're paying tuition. They deserve, you know, not just to to attend the the college and the campus they want to attend, but they have graduations coming up. Now they're canceling those as well. It's so goofy and so messed up. So, and it's done purely for those political gains that the Democrats want to hope to get in Michigan and Minnesota. So I think something happened, right? Because the White House sent out Corrine Jean-Pierre, the press secretary, the middle of the afternoon yesterday. Yeah. Then our interview with Mike Johnson aired here at 6 o'clock Eastern. Corrine Jean-Pierre said the president would be speaking in a handful of days. Mm-hmm. Mike Johnson comes on the show and says the silence is deafening. And then all of a sudden, Julia, this morning, the White House unannounced or at least unscheduled, I guess is a good way to put it, 
says, uh, you know what, the president's going to be speaking. What, what do you think the conversations inside the White House were like to say, you know what, he's got to say something? He's got to say something, and it comes as he's really juggling two different constituencies. One constituency is the very pro-Israel J- Jewish part of the Democratic Party, majority uh, Jewish part of the Democratic Party, as well as the more progressive, um, you know, pro-Palestinian part of the party. It was interesting watching the events really unfold on campus because you had a number of House Democrats, many of them Jewish, come to visit Columbia, and many of those same House Democrats signed on to a letter demanding 21 of them demanding that Columbia either tear down the encampment or um, the board resigns. Right. And then, of course, you have progressive members like Congresswoman Ilhan Omar going to visit the protesters. So it's such a divide within the party. I mean, I think that's why he obviously waited so long. No, Noah Tishby, Emmanuel Acho, I know you're there. Hang on for, for just one second here because I want to play and get to you real quick. Uh, Mick Mulvaney, White House chief of staff, was on this show yesterday when we were trying to figure out when's the president going to speak about this. And this is what Mick said. I think Biden is going to get to the point where, I don't know if it's from the Oval Office, if it's at the Holocaust Museum, he needs to give a major speech on this, or else, goodness gracious, people are going to wonder, why do you want the job? I mean, this is not a story that's going away. Those were mixed instincts. As a former White House chief of staff, I see you smiling here. But why do you, what do you think the decision was like? I think because we've been in the briefing room every day this week and we were pressing them on this. We noticed the, the silence. We noticed Karine Jean-Pierre coming out and saying that this is going to be something that's left up to the universities to decide. That's what she said on Monday. Then we got a statement from Andrew Bates. We were talking about the spokesperson from the White House talking about this, that these are not peaceful protests as we saw them barricade in the building on Monday night. I think they were trying to, as much as they could, keep him from having to go out and address this because of how tense this is and and this delicate balance they're doing for his constituencies. Um, But I think ultimately they came to today. What what are those conversations like? Well, look, look, but understand, if these were um, people on campus um, rallying angry against black people, gay people, Asians... They would shut this down and you rightly take, so you take immediate. To that. No, they would I, shut I, I this take down issue to it because I've heard way and many they Republicans have. always they throw in there, black people in protests, a, and it, it's really out, frustrating. There is a carve out for the Jewish people, whereas if you're bigoted toward them, it seems to be okay at least for a month or so from this White House. It's not really a problem. We'll worry about it later. It, Anybody else? And we've seen this on campus before. Not only would those people be taken off campus, not only if they had visas, they'd be revoked and sent back to their countries, but they'd hold vigils. The White House would be out in full force, and rightly so. They don't do it for a, a big. The first gentleman is a Jewish man. I, I think that we have to really take into consideration ones that, that we are still it. talking about in the in the context of this. Still, will fall on universities and university presidents. However, we have a White House that is being attentive to the fact that students, and up to and including non-students, because we saw a letter that came out from former Obama officials that are all wanting to see a change in the way that the American foreign policy is actually funding what is going on in Israel because of the deaths of those that are in Gaza. We're also seeing the college. Democrats who called this out as, as well, wanting to see a change in our policy as it relates to funding what is going on in Israel right now. And I think that this president, he is really managing a very tough situation, one in which he cannot, um, he, he is not in charge of the IDF. He's not going to remove Netanyahu, and at any given point, he's not going to be able to stop the Israeli war. What he does have to do is manage expectations on multiple sides of the aisle here, and that is a very uh-huh. difficult thing to do, and these students have every right to protest, and demonizing them and saying that they're, you know, advocating for Hamas or that they are somehow desensitized to um, being Americans, I think that's really sad, because this is what this is what well, America's founded we, we, on, our democracy. I don't think people are saying everyone there is Hamas, but we have seen They've pro-Hamas chanted. sentiments. We have seen intifada, and, and obviously there are exceptions to the rule, and in this case... No, the Hamas have, and the intifada comments yeah. are exceptions okay. to the rule. The overwhelming majority of students are not shouting either of those. All right, come on in. Noah Tishby and Emmanuel Acho, two best-selling authors. They have collaborated on the new book, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Jew. Noah is a former Israeli envoy known for combating anti-Semitism. Emmanuel played in the National Football League and is also known for his Uncomfortable Conversations <laughs> series. Hello to you both. Uh, Noah, it's nice to have you back here on the Hill. Always Great enjoy talking here. to you. Uh, Emmanuel, I'm a, I'm a fan of yours, so nice to have you back here. Thank you, thank you. Or nice to have you here on the Hill for the first time. Uh, do you want to respond to any of that? I, I know you've been, been listening in, but I don't know. Maybe, Noah, I'll start with you. Oh, wow. Do you want me to respond to the conversations you guys, guys just had? Sure, I will respond. 
Here is the thing. Right now, if you are a college student on campus and you are uh, protesting with um, the people that are speaking up against Israel, sadly, you are supporting Hamas. That is the fact of the matter. When people are calling for a ceasefire and they're actually only calling on Israel for a ceasefire, who didn't take a ceasefire for months? It's Hamas. Hamas's intention is not to have a ceasefire. Hamas's intention is not to have peace in Israel. Hamas's intention is a genocide on the Jewish people, is to take Israel down, which is not at all what Israel's intention is. So I think that by now, anybody on campus that is protesting is supporting Hamas propaganda on campus. So you wrote the book, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Jew. Let's talk about it here for a second. Emmanuel, you also wrote a book, Uncomfortable Conversations uh, with, uh, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. So I, I, I wonder what sort of, Emmanuel, steered you toward Noah, and why did you feel the need to, to talk about this and, and get involved with it? Well, I feel like too many people are speaking ignorantly. They're speaking without listening. You're supposed to be slow to speak and quick to listen, but right now everybody is quick to speak and incredibly slow <laughs> to listen. I wanted to educate myself. Without education, there can be no empathy, but how can I educate myself if I have no expertise? And Noah's experience is her expertise. So rather than living my life ignorantly, I said, let me educate myself on what is going on in the world. So many people watching right now can't even define Zionism. So many people watching right now can't define what it means to be anti-Semitic. There isn't a Semite group to be anti. So let me write this book. Let me learn from Noah. Let me learn with Noah and let everybody else who's watching and seeing all the destruction, not just happening in the world, but happening in their world, let them learn as well so they can educatedly get involved in the dialogue. And I think so so much of what's happening right now on college campus is literally because of lack of education, because of lack of conversation. Mm. I tried to talk to a lot of these demonstrators. I have friends who try to talk to a lot of these demonstrators. They don't want to talk and they don't want to listen, which is why I wanted to write this book. So, look, this is one of the reasons why I love doing this show. I love working at News Nation, right? Because we can have these conversations. You can listen to Amisha. You can listen to Hogan, right? And we, we do this all day long. Noah, you've been on this show before. You, you know how it goes. Um, I, I, want, I want to highlight one of the un- uncomfortable conversations you both had in your book. Here's the chapter. So, are Jews white? <laughs> <laughs> I, see, I see you laughing now, but I know it was, it was a bit uncomfortable, so walk me through it, please. Um, I, I'll be blunt, and I'll be very vulnerable and transparent with you and the audience. I, I felt as though the Jewish community, they wanted the privileges of being perceived as white in America without what comes with being perceived as white in America, which is being perceived as the oppressor. And so I said, wait a second, Noah, are Jews white? And Noah said, well, Noah Emmanuel, I'm not white, I'm Jewish. And that's when we had that tension in, in the book and in that chapter, you can literally feel the tension jump off of the pages because she was explaining to me that Jews aren't white. And it is incredibly fascinating fascinating that Jews were persecuted and executed for not being white during the Holocaust, but in America, they're called white. So Noah, that was one of the most fascinating chapters. It really was. And this is what can happen when you have these conversations and you don't need a trigger okay. warning and you don't get offended. You can take everything and put it on the table. The conversation of Judaism is not just a religion, it's an ethno-religion. Yeah. So we're a part of a tribe. And to say that the Jews are white because they're white passing in America, or at least okay. most of the American Jewish community, that's ignoring thousands of years of Jewish history, persecution, discrimination, marginalization, a Oppression, Holocaust, it used to be no blacks, no Jews up until about a second and a half ago. And uh, it was very (laughs) important for us to actually talk about that. So uh, as you might know, we had the House Speaker Mike Johnson on this show yesterday uh, for for quite some time. And I asked him, Noah, because you've been, you know this, but for our audience here on News Nation and listening to us on Sirius XM, you have been lobbying, not lobbying, but you have been speaking to Congress for quite some time now about anti-Semitism, and it has become an issue here in Washington. We've seen bills get voted on and the like. But one of the ideas that the House Speaker has talked about is potentially taxing the major university endowments. I want you to listen to what he said, and I'll get your reaction on the other side. There's a lot of discussion about whether they should be taxed. Um, they also get very generous tax benefits as right. you know, they operate as nonprofits. There, a lot of that is on the table. There'll be a lot of discussion, investigation. Uh, we have to do what we must to, uh, to stamp this out. This anti-Semitism movement is dangerous. Noah, do you think that that would be effective? Do you think there's really anything that Washington can do, legislators, lawmakers here in Washington, 
to combat, to to curb anti-Semitism? Absolutely. First of all, I think adopting the IRA definition, the the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism was a really, really powerful move. And here's the thing. These universities cannot go without any punishment, any consequences whatsoever. There's something that has to be done. And there has been a culture on campus of anti-Semitism that has been brewing for decades. This is not a new phenomenon. I've been talking about this in my first book. We have been talking about this for many, many, many years, trying trying to make people understand that this is happening. If there is a culture of anti-Semitism on campus, if students are allowed to vote on BDS referendums, if there is apartheid week and apartheid wall, and that whole like seething kind of culture on campus that's been going on for so long, of course we're going to see what's happening now. And these universities, they have to start uh, suffering some consequences for that. The book is Uncomfortable Conversations with a Jew. Emmanuel Acho, Noah Tishby. Again, Noah, nice to see you and nice to speak with you as always. Emmanuel, hope you come on back. No Uh, doubt doubt about about it. (laughs) You're welcome anytime. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you both. Thank you. All right. Uh, before we head to break, again, I, this is one of the reasons why I love the show. It's because we hear from you. We hear from you. We hear from fantastic journalists. This is their new book. Um, and I don't know. I, I want to give you a last word here. I mean, it, it may be an interesting book. I think that at, at the end of the day, one of the things he started off opening up saying, Acho here, expertise, experience, um, these are the things you need before you have these conversations. As somebody who consistently posits himself as a black man who can speak to black history in America, who's actually a Nigerian-American who has not had the experience or the familial contact with the civil rights movement, with um, any, of the, any of the various uh, movements against black people in this country, it's always very interesting to me that he's the one who's using that framing because it's also offensive to people. Isn't, who it, actually isn't, come it, from that isn't it interesting, though, to hear from him? I've, I've heard from him a lot. He tends to speak on this often, and his background in it, again, is very, very thin. What did you take away from it? I mean, look, I think, uh, you know, I think that's no, Noah is coming from a very pro Israel side of this. There, right. There's no question about that. Um, you know, I think ultimately uh, we're at a point and we're seeing this happen on college campuses where you're seeing two sides of an issue that really can't see each other. And this has been bubbling up for some time. And it's just it's fascinating to see how this foreign conflict thousands of miles away is impacting really our everyday life here and impacting an election here. It's impacting U.S. politics and policy. Seven, seven months and what are we, six months to a presidential yeah. election? So, mm-hmm. yeah. All right. Meantime, still to come from the Hill and thank you to Noah. And Emmanuel. Still to come here from the Hill over the next 45 minutes. Why does the FBI have Senator Lindsey Graham's phone? What the South Carolina Republican revealed that could happen to any of us. Plus, Congress, Mario Andretti, and Formula One, the international drama that's taking Washington to the racetrack. Plus, on the other side of the break, Hogan, something happened with your guy, Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. Your guy. You know what I'm talking yeah. about. Donald Trump, he came before the cameras today, and I I saw it, and I thought to myself, hmm, I wonder if this is what we're going to hear. I'm going to ask you if you can change my mind on it on the other side of the break. I'm ready. Hogan Gidley, here, When the Hill Returns. Stay with us. All right, welcome back here to the Hill on News Nation. So uh, earlier this morning, Donald Trump walks into the courthouse for the trial in New York City, and you know what he's been doing. He's been going before the cameras. He gives his, like, I don't know, two, three, four, five-minute speech, and then he goes on into court, right? Mm-hmm. And so Donald Trump said something today. First, he talked about the, you know, the, the court proceedings and what he thinks of them. We know what he thinks of them. But it's what he said after that that got my attention. Watch. The economy, people are asking me about the economy, it's doing terribly, and interest rates are obviously not going to be able to be reduced prior to the election because inflation is roaring back. Gasoline's way up, other things are way up, and it's roaring back like they are very surprised. I'm not surprised, but they're surprised. I guess they're surprised. That's what they say anyway. All right, so he went to the economy, inflation, and gas prices, and I thought, Hogan, That is what I am going to hear from Donald Trump every single day for the next six months. You going to change my mind on that at all? I don't think so. Uh, Obviously, there'll be other issues that Donald Trump talks about between now and November. But I do think this still remains one of the top issues the American people face. And the reason he's talking about it is because the juxtaposition of where we were under his leadership versus where we are now is stark. And the American people feel the fact that you're paying more for gas and for groceries and for mortgage rates and for rent, car payments, et cetera. And there's one difference between 
um, um, then and now, and that's leadership. And Joe Biden has ruined this economy. The American people know it. Every poll uh, points that out. And so Donald Trump, of course, when he has the microphone, is going to use that time to say So I am like, going to get that every single day for six it, months or no? Ish. 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 What's the ish? Well, I'm sure we'll if hear. If he can stay on I'm message. Sure, no, I'm sure we'll hear a lot about uh, okay. immigration as well. I'm sure we'll hear a lot about crime. I'm sure we'll hear a lot about the wars breaking out all over the world. Okay. But the economy's still at home. People's checkbooks, people's pocketbooks. That's where elections are won and lost. He's going to drill down on that. I was just going to say, I, I was watching that as he came out this morning, and I think he was trying so hard because he can't say anything else about the trial. Yeah. <laughs> and he was trying so hard. And I know he wants to talk about the economy. He does talk about the economy. But he loves railing on this trial and mentioning yeah. the names. And he got oh, all those too. gag orders. He had that hearing this morning about the gag order. He was, you could, you felt it. He I, couldn't talk about it. I guess it. here's part of my point as I was thinking about it earlier today. The campus protest, he then went on to talk about campus protests. Yep. I think the campus protests will be transitory. I think, like, summer's going to come and it's going to go and, you know, these students will have jobs or internships or whatever. Who knows what they're doing. Um, I but love the know going to hire them, but, but go ahead. But inflation will not be transitory. We know, we've know we known this now for three years, right? It's here and it's sticky. And that's why I wonder if he's uh, going to pound that message or not. Here was President Biden, by the way, earlier today on the economy. And guess what? The plan we put in place is beginning to work. We've created a record... 15 million jobs since I came to office. There was any president has 15 million. Including 460,000 right here in North Carolina. Is that the message that sells? I think it is. Um, of course, a lot of those jobs we're not going to see truly ruled out until the summer. Um, and I say that because, like, many of them require a specific level of training and other things before you can actually jump into them. But we know that his infrastructure plan, hundreds of millions of jobs across this country, many of those will be taken advantage of mostly in southern states, to be honest. States that are Republican-led. I think hundreds of thousands. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Of jobs across this yeah, country. Okay. In addition to that, we saw the CHIPS Act, and it brought an additional amount of jobs here, specifically in technology. There's no denying that those things exist. So I think he definitely has that to talk about. What do you make of both of those? Like, what sticks out to you as the national political reporter for the Hill? <laughs> Julia, when you hear both those sound like. So look, from Biden, this is something that Democrats have been pushing for a while. I was actually having a conversation earlier today with a Florida Democrat, and I said, you guys are focusing so much on abortion. What are you going to say when there's a Florida voter who says, yeah, I disagree with this abortion ban in Florida, but I think the economy isn't doing so well. And then uh, the Democrat automatically pivoted to Biden's accomplishments, the Infrastructure Act, job growth that kind of a thing. With Trump, look, I think it shows that time is precious and it's really of the essence for him. He does not get as much campaign time as right. Biden is going to get. And I think we can only uh, look back to a few weeks ago in North Carolina when that rally was canceled because of the weather. So right. he has to take every opportunity he can to really message on that. So you changed my mind-ish. <laughs> Good. Sort of. Well, there you go. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't trying to change it all the way. I just wanted a little... Caveat, right, nuance. There, there you go. Still much more ahead here on the Hill. What are the biggest threats facing the United States right now? The nation's top intelligence chief testifying about that very issue today up on Capitol Hill. The retired four-star general, Wesley Clark, joins us here on the Hill on the other side of the break. You're watching the Hill. Stay with us. Putin's increasingly aggressive tactics against Ukraine, such as the strikes on Ukraine's electricity infrastructure, are intended to impress on Ukraine that continuing to fight will only increase the damage to Ukraine and offer no plausible path to victory. And these aggressive tactics are likely to continue, and the war is unlikely to end anytime soon. Welcome back. That, of course, is the Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, up on Capitol Hill today, warning the Senate... The end to Russia's war in Ukraine is nowhere in sight. It comes nearly one week after President Biden signed the long-awaited foreign aid package, which includes $60 billion in aid to Ukraine. Joining us now to discuss the retired Army General, four-star General Wesley Clark, also the former NATO Allied Supreme Commander. General Clark, great to see you as always, sir. Thank you for being back with us here on the Hill. So you heard the National Intelligence Director right there. Is she right? Well, I think she's right. I don't think Ukraine is uh, is willing to compromise and give up its territory. Uh, I don't think the Ukrainian military is going to collapse, even though things are pretty tough right now until that American assistance gets there. And I don't think Russia is willing to give in. So uh, it's an endurance contest. 
Uh, and it's also a contest of national will and whether the United States and NATO will stand firm to support a beleaguered democracy. So, so she said it. You think she's right, which I guess leads me to my next question, sir. What, what happens next? And if both of you are right, how long is this going to go on? Well, I don't think you can look at it in terms of a time uh, exactly, because um, what you've got here is a critical situation that affects global security. Were Ukraine to collapse, we'd be faced uh, with a huge national security crisis in Europe, and it would empower the Chinese to go after Taiwan. So we can't measure it uh, on the clock. And if Russia collapses, maybe it'll be the end of Vladimir Putin, and uh, that would be a welcome sign. So I think what you're going to see is through the next summer, you're going to see offensives and defensives rolling back and forth. You're going to see the U.S. aid coming in. Russia is going to try to make a big play here in the next uh, month and a half to try to grab as much terrain as it can. It may make a new assault on Kyiv. Uh, and so it's going to be a hair-raising time in Ukraine and for the West. And then that summer will probably end with a Ukrainian counteroffensive that regains much of the territory lost. 2025 may be decisive. It, it, it just struck me that you said if, if Russia loses, sir, that, it, that this could mean the end of Putin there. And I, I wonder, as I hear you say that, if that is part of the calculation here for the United States. Obviously, we, we want to stand by Russia, by Ukraine and are standing by Ukraine for a variety of reasons. But does, does that part of it factor into the equation also? Well, I think there are some who are afraid that if Putin uh, were to lose his position, maybe Russia would disintegrate. Uh, but uh, I don't think that's going to happen, even if Putin does lose his position. But look, Putin is the most experienced statesman in the world today. He's a wily intelligence agent, and uh, we'd be very much better off if he uh, goes into the sunset somewhere and retires. Hmm. Uh, I'm going to leave you with this, General Clark. There was a story in The Washington Post this afternoon that I had to do a double take, really got my attention. This is the headline, quote, U.S. officials wary of Chinese plans for floating nuclear plants. Officials fear reactors will be used to power military bases on artificial islands in the South China Sea, floating nuclear plants. What does that mean? And what goes through your head when you see that? Well, let's speculate a little bit here. We're moving rapidly with technology. So you're going to see more and more use of lasers and directed energy, things like microwave in the future. And we know from Ukraine how effective electronic warfare is. All of this requires massive amounts of electricity. You can't get it with a normal generator. Put a nuclear power plant there, put some battery storage with it, do it the right way, you could have uh, megawatts of energy into your jamming, into your electronic warfare. You could block aircraft from coming into the area. So then are we gonna do this too at some point? Well, I think that uh, it is a significant step forward for the Chinese if they have that kind of power available in the 2027-2029 period. Um, I think we have to look out for a lot of new technology that goes with it. General Wesley Clark, it is always fascinating to hear from you. Thank you for being back with us here on the Hill. Talk to you soon. Thank you. That is scary. Mm. When, when you hear that, we talk about the possibility of floating nuclear plants and what he just what he just outlined there. No, it absolutely is scary. And I think we're really, it's obviously we're approaching a turning point. We're already at a turning point in the war. And I think that's why with the national security supplemental last week, we saw, you know, the leaders of this country, the speaker of the house, the president, et cetera, really, that's why they're pushing it because there is the threat of that going forward. How how worried were, was, was your administration with the South China Sea and China and and where all of that was headed? Well, obviously we were concerned about trade with China. We tried to cripple them as best we could, taking a lot of their money, um, which was a good thing for us. Obviously, these types of conversations when you're talking about national security um, and dealing with other nations are very fraught with danger. Yeah. Um, they are very layered. They're Floating very com- nuclear they're plants. very complicated. I mean, 
Um, yes. And and when I saw that headline and read that piece, it just kind of made me go, gosh, you forget how right. impactful and important so many things that do go on in this town are frivolous and yeah. stupid. That's like, one that really matters. Like we talk about the iPhone moment and how that changed. We've gone from like iPhone moment to maybe floating nuclear, nuclear plants. plants. I don't know. My goodness. All right. Well, meantime, according to a report from The Washington Times, the South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham revealed the FBI, speaking of phones, has possession of his cell phone. At least he said that yesterday. Nothing nefarious here, though, on his end. According to the Washington Times, the senator said during an event here in the town, quote, so I get a message, I think, from Schumer, meaning Chuck Schumer. It ain't from Schumer. And next thing you know, my phone, I I don't know what. Apparently, you create, uh, anything you create apparently can be hacked. Now, we have reached out to Lindsey Graham's office for comment here, but hacking the phone of a senator? I didn't know you could hack a flip phone. That's so that's, that's the other thing. And he still use yeah. a flip phone? I thought he still the flip phone, too. So, I, doesn't Chuck Schumer have the flip phone? Chuck, Chuck Schumer has the flip it's phone. Just, maybe that's how. It's the flip phone, <laughs> flip phone to flip you, phone conversation. Yeah. I mean, when we talk about, th- there was a conversation, this all was started with a conversation on AI and, and Lindsey Graham, that's reportedly when he jumped in and made the comments. We don't know if this is anything AI related, but I mean, hacking a senator's phone, all this stuff to me is just wild. Yeah, and we do know that people have sent impersonation texts before. This sure. has happened to everyday citizens. Yeah. Um, and if you respond or if you click a link or do something like that, they can't yeah. get access to your phone. So I do think that even not being AI related, this is something that should be a heightened issue of awareness and security. Also, um, there should probably be, and I don't know how you would do this, but there should probably be extra security on these people's phones. No, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they do that yeah. for the president and the first lady. Sure. Do, do they do it for like the leader and the house speaker and all that, you know? I actually, I, I don't know, but I would hope they do it because right. no. I think there's obviously this threat of hacking, yeah. national security threat, but also you're starting to see, and we've seen this for a number of years now, um, lawmakers are becoming targets. Right? Yeah. Their mm-hmm. safety is at risk. Yep. So. All right. Meantime, coming up here from the Hill, you know his name, maybe, Mario Andretti. He is one of the most successful drivers in the history of motorsports. So why is he asking Congress to get involved in his business matters. Plus, you sent out a tweet today. <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing. Not everybody's attention, it, I think. It, She sent out a, a tweet, and I sent it to our whole team. I was like, did you see what, what Meyer just sent out? <laughs> what she observed, we'll get to it on the other side of the break. You're watching The Hill here on News Nation. <laughs> Grand Prix. But are Americans actually being excluded American drivers from them and teams from the most prestigious racing series in all the world. For example, Mario Andretti, one of the greatest drivers ever, was in Washington this week asking Congress for help after his team was denied entry. Now, Congress has answered the call with a bipartisan group of lawmakers sending a letter to F1 owner Liberty Media, demanding answers and accusing them of possibly violating antitrust laws. Now, the lawmakers writing, by the way, this is bipartisan, Democrats and Republicans getting involved here, quote, it is unfair and wrong to attempt to block American companies from joining Formula One, which could also violate anti-American antitrust laws. So not only is it the team, but it's also the engine here because it is General Motors. And so these lawmakers now are jumping in and saying, you know what, let Mario Andretti in. I'm glad that it's happening. I'm a big Mario Andretti fan to Are begin you? with, so this is like, I, I, didn't I, know that I about love you. racing in general. Huh. Um, NASCAR, stuff? Formula really? One, you name it. Yes. Okay. I'm gl- just glad to see Democrats come to the table and decide to stand up for the internal combustion engine <laughs> and not be concerned because this car is not made to run on gumdrops. Gummy bears and you even hair. you even got a Misha to laugh on that one. I thought she was ready to agree. You two were ready to agree, and then you made her laugh. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Not bad. Uh, it'll be it'll be interesting to see uh, where this ends up going because again, American team, American engine, and lawmakers, bipartisan jumping in. All right, another celebrity sighting. Meantime, over at the White House, Ralphie, uh, Ralph right. rather. Venus? Rafe. 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 Rafe Fines. I do, I do sports and news. <laughs> I get that the sweats. I, I tell our team all the time, I do sports and news. What's the name? Rafe Fines. Rafe. Rafe Fines. All right. He's Voldemort in the Harry Potter series. Was there to send President Biden off today before his trip to North Carolina. This is what you... Show the, show the tweet from Kelly. Uh, you say, last Thursday, Kim K was at the White House. Today, Voldemort, who is next? But th- oh, there was something else that happened there. Explained so, sort of like the... 
the behind the, the commotion, scenes. Commotion, but the behind the scenes. Yeah. yeah. No, that's why I love the show because we could go into the little details. There you go. People appreciate this. Okay, so they call for the press when the president is departing from the White House uh, because we can go up and try to ask a question right. as he leaves. They held us back, and as soon as they let us in, and that's was, not that's not standard. Not yeah. Not standard. They, and then as soon as we got through, he was already walking up the stairs of Marine One, and we didn't get a chance to ask a question, and we were like, what happened? <laughs> so the, the staff comes out. We all go on our phones, start complaining. White House staff comes <laughs> out and says, oh, a celebrity was here in the Rose Garden. Secret Service wouldn't let you come out. And we looked around for who it was, and it was Ray Fiennes, and everybody said, oh, Voldemort stopped us from <laughs> asking the president <laughs> questions today. So what, what, what happens is, as you know, yeah. They, they call the media out, and we stand there in 90 to, when it's 90 degrees or 9, when it's rain or sunshine, whatever, and you wait for, and then the president walks across and gets aboard Air Force One, but none of that happened today no. because of Voldemort. Right. Stop us. But the Secret Service said because of Voldemort you couldn't come out? That's what was told to us, that we couldn't. What's, oh, what's, were- oh, first of all, what's Biden's <laughs> code name for the Secret Service? I don't know. Is it Voldemort? Like, because that may make more, that would make a lot oh, more sense. That would make a lot more sense. Oh Why can goodness. you not come out? Yeah, if the, right. Like you can come out with the the, the most powerful man on the planet, but not Voldemort. Apparently, so he said they were already in the Rose Garden. Voldemort and President Biden were in the Rose Garden, and then they couldn't let us get by to get to behind the rope to ask. Oh the goodness! So in any case, oh, he stopped us, come and on. that was it. What about the tweet, the X, whatever? Um, him, then Kim yeah, K. Yeah, Kim K was here last Thursday, and now we have Ray Fine. What's going on? So I don't know. There's just, you know, celebrities popping through. I saw Conan O'Brien in there a couple weeks ago. Really? So, And then they have the awards tomorrow, the, the medal of... Hmm. So there might be folks. You guys used sure. to have celebrities, including Kim Kardashian, come through all the time. I email Kim Kardashian. Dude, oh, come on. Uh, it's a true story. What's that like? Very fascinating. What's that like? It's just interesting because we're trying to... We're doing criminal justice reform together, mm-hmm. so... You know, you had to email her a couple times. Directly? Just, yes. Directly. What's that like? You just email her and respond. <laughs> okay, Whatever. cool. I want to know. There you go. Partly why you watch The Hill. <laughs> Still to come here from The Hill on News Nation, I sat down with the House Speaker, Mike Johnson. Fascinating for politics. Maybe not like emailing Kimmy K, but who knows. Uh, and part of that interview has gone viral. We were on, get this, The View of all places earlier today. Who took note of what and what's the common thread with it all? The big takeaway from our big interview when The Hill returns. That's it. All right, welcome back here to The Hill on News Nation. Speaker Mike Johnson's comments on this very program yesterday making headlines all over the country. Pick your news outlet. Left, right, middle, television, print, you name it. They probably covered it. The top news-making moment, though, came from the speaker's comments on Marjorie Taylor Greene. For example, they were even talking about it earlier today on The View. Here's how he's responding to Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is leading the charge to put him out of a job. Take a look. (laughs) Marjorie Taylor Greene. Mm -hmm. (laughs) No fan of yours. Um, Bless her heart, yeah. Is she a serious lawmaker? Uh, I don't think she's uh, proving to be. No, um, I don't spend a lot of time uh, thinking about her. The Uniparty is make Ukraine great again. You know, Marge, (laughs) (laughs) I think everybody's just trying to support somebody who can get work done. So it was fascinating to me because we had... A, a wide-ranging interview with him. I mean, he sat on this set and said, I would be okay with sending the military in for mass deportations. But it's Marjorie Taylor Greene that's getting the pickup. What is it about MTG? Look, I mean, this is, I think, the top story coming out of Washington, really. Marjorie Taylor Greene, this motion to vacate, or that's going to happen supposedly next yeah. week. And I think there's a fascination as, you know, into the division and polarization that we're seeing on Capitol Hill. And I think people consuming political news, that's what they're drawn to. What is it about her? I think it's also because she's an unlikely standout. Um, yeah. her, her character, the way she presents herself, the fact that she's kind of risen. Um, be mindful, she still hasn't been there that long, but the right. outsized amount of coverage that she she has makes it seem like she's been there longer um and to be a part of a faction a very small faction of people who one don't have the votes to get half the things done that they want to get done but it's also an extremist and an extremist who loves to be vilified she like is eating this up right yeah so what does it mean for donald trump 
Nothing? Nothing? I don't think so. Because she wants Mike Johnson out. He wants Mike Johnson to stay. It, yeah, I mean, and I mean, it, it, it's not a problem for him? Or a, lot like, of things, to- a lot of things fascinating about that clip. First of all, okay. Whoopi Goldberg would no more defend <laughs> Speaker Johnson than fly to the moon. Okay? okay? She hates him, vilifies him all the time. The second part of this is, being from the South, yes. I'm well aware of what bless her heart Bless means. her heart. And I guarantee you, MTG, he's used that same exact phrase She's when she Georgia. wanted to tell someone. To, to, to you know what. To, to uh, you know what yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. off right? yeah. So I'm interested to see how this goes. Obviously, there are a lot of Republicans out there who are going to support Speaker Johnson. MTG is going to bring this forward. Democrats will probably help save him. And then she can say, see, I told you so the whole time. Right. This guy's terrible or whatever. Okay. You know, just more D.C. DC Nonsense. Center. All right. One country singer, by the way, is taking notice of the fraternity brothers at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, who defended the American flag from pro-Palestinian protesters this week. John Rich, who is part of the famous singing duo Big and Rich, is now offering a free concert for those college students, announcing on X, quote, I've made contact with the Patriots at UNC, working on a date to have a massive event to celebrate our flag and those who love her. I'll keep you all posted. Let's call it Flagstock, so you can make Flagstock trend. Let's go. He's doing it. You know, I mean, it's it's just it's interesting what's coming from this. I don't know. I saw that how much money they were raising. Yeah, it's like uh, I think over four hundred thousand for that fraternity. Oh, I haven't even. That's. I've wow. been to his house in Nashville. I've so been you're, to his bar in texting, Nashville. You're texting with John. So I you, was I texting learned, with John Rich before this. So yes. John, so Hogan was texting with John Rich during this show. Yes. In which he also revealed that he had been emailing with Kim Kardashian at one point in his life. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're I not even talking about just... the rest of my role yeah, today. Was, <laughs> it's been like that. a name-dropping thing for me. I didn't mean it to be. Yeah, actually, I didn't bring up Kim K. You did. I, I did bring it up in your yeah. defense. Good on John Rich, though. Yeah, good for him. He loves the country. He's one of the most patriotic people I know. And he does stuff at his house all the time for soldiers, for vets. Yeah. So many people, so much good he does in that community. So good for him. John Rich, by the way, will be live here on News Nation. In uh, just a few moments' time, he is joining Leland Vitter for On Balance tonight here on News Nation right after the hill. Don't want to miss that. Leland and John Rich. Been a fun show. Thank you all.